done it a few times. you all to stand as we sing this morning. Um, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord fill this place with song and joy this morning. It's a little rainy outside, but it's warm and sunny and bright and cheerful. And so let the praises of our King fill this place this morning. Amen.
I'm your clerk on duty today, and uh, it's a rainy day in Georgia, yes, but we're here, and there's lots of sunshine in this place. Amen. I have your announcements for you, and um, let's see, the first announcement will be from the pastor's uh, pastor, Pastor Barber, um, there will be a business meeting next Sabbath, well, not next Sabbath, it will be Sabbath, November 14th, at Sunset. It is next Sabbath. Okay, wake up. Okay, I had a rough morning. Yes, I, I, I got up and my basement was flooded, so. But it'll be taken care of. Okay, so next Sabbath, November 14th at sunset. So please, everyone, adjust your schedule so that you'll be able to attend and discuss the business of the church. Without your participation, then this can't happen. Um, the South Atlantic Book Center has a part-time job, so anyone looking for a part-time job, but you need to be bilingual, Spanish and English. If you're interested, please contact Mrs. Sylvia Coleman at 404-799-1003, extension 305, and please apply before November 9th, which is right around the corner. Um, wonderful announcement for the St. Lee family. Brother Paul and Sister Deanne Santilli are the proud grandparents of little baby Caden Paul Santilli, who was born October 28th in, a, in Orlando, Florida. Um, the Santillis have traveled to Orlando this weekend to meet with their first grandchild. Amen. Um, the children's end of the year program will be on December 12th during divine service. Rehearsal will take place today and every Sabbath until December 5th. A small donation per family is needed by December 14th. Please check um, for further information with Sister Jahira Davis for all the children and their parents. The next announcement is from the AYS department. Please come out this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. The title of the AY today will be Choosing Music for Yourself, a very important topic. So um, Pastor Darrell Palmer, We'll be presenting that program this afternoon, so please come out and please support this program. And right after sunset, there will be an indoor soccer for all the little ones. And I see they're all over here on my right. So all the little ones, there'll be a soccer right after, indoor soccer, right after um, sunset. Uh, my next announcement is from the seniors department, and Sister Cross would like me to read this to the church. Um, senior day is Sabbath, November 14, 2015, and to all, you are cordially invited to attend the play, David and Goliath, directly after lunch, November 14, 2015, and it's going to be right here in the sanctuary. Your presence is kindly requested. Um, it's from the Shiloh Drama Ensemble. I didn't know we had one. <laughs> and 
to this end, we do need to get together to practice. So all the seniors or everyone who signed up to be a part of this play, Sister Clark is asking that you stay right after church and meet with here, her on this side of the church. Right, Sister Clark? Right, she has important things she needs to discuss with you. So please attend. And I think that is it for my announcement. And at this time, we'd like to acknowledge the um, birthday celebrants. Happy birthday to you. Okay, so um, November 8th, which is tomorrow, we have Pauline Claude who will be celebrating a birthday. And also tomorrow, November 8th, we have our own first elder, Brother Glenn Wallace. Amen, happy birthday. And um, George Phipps. I don't see Brother Phipps, but he'll also be celebrating his birthday tomorrow. So whenever you see them, please give them a hug and wish them God's blessing. We have lots of birthdays on the 8th. Um, Samantha Campbell, happy birthday, and Esther Davis. So all those people will be celebrating their birthdays tomorrow. Okay, November 12th, we have two celebrants, Lauren Strode Humphrey and Brenda Malawi. Happy birthday, and on the 13th, we have three celebrants. Mark Wright, he's not here today. Tudette Hammond, I don't see her. And Kaylin White. So happy birthday, and may God continue to bless all the celebrants. Pastor Barber, we have a second reading. And these are for individuals transferring out of Shiloh to um, the Atlantic Kenyan Pendo SDA Company, and that's in Mableton, Georgia. And they are Pauline Ijikanero and Victor, her husband, Sarah Karanja, Willie Migui, and Friedland Larrick Verlis. So they all will be transferring out of Shiloh, and this is their second reading. Can you give an amen to our clerk for pronouncing those names correctly? <laughs> she showed that okay. to me, and I demanded that she would do this. Not with me. <laughs> but uh, those names are, have been read. You know, I want to commend this church, first of all, for starting companies and churches. You know, these churches grew out of here. Yeah. And that says much. So that means we've got to replenish our stock. Amen? Amen. All right. What's your pleasure on voting these names that have been mentioned? You know their names. <laughs> What's your pleasure that we would vote these names as bona fide members of this new company? Is there a second? All in favor, aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign, it is carried. Amen. And um, closing thought from the clerk's desk will be Proverbs 22, 6, which is also on your bulletin. And this is a text that is familiar to most of us. And it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from this. And at this time, we'll have um, Brother Rodney has an announcement. And following Brother Rodney, we'll have Sister Pauline Cook, who will follow him with her announcement. And have a blessed Sabbath. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Looking very good down there. All right. I have an announcement to make in regards to the um, uh, several weeks ago, we included in the bulletin and we made several announcements regarding a relief for Dominica. Remember, they had a flood there, and we, were, uh, we, we got together and we decided we we're going to um, send some barrels down there with food and clothing and stuff like that. So. We have done well so far. We have uh, two barrels all loaded with clothing. Thank you all very much. And we have one more barrel that we want to send, and we want to send food in this one. Now, we have some stuff already, but we need your help in terms of providing some food. We also need uh, things like um, medical supplies and uh, school supplies. You know, of course, with all the things that went on there anyway, we want to help out as much as we possibly can. 
So what we'd like you to do, please, is that if you have some of the stuff around your home or if you can purchase it, by all means, we would welcome that. We want to send the barrels out as soon as possible in the, within the next couple of weeks or so. And if you can get two barrels, that'll be even greater. But, uh, but we have one, and it's all in the gym right there now. It's empty, so please, we want you to fill that up with food and all that. Some of the things that we probably need, of course, would be, of course, as I mentioned, school supplies. We want, you know, rice, flour, the staples that we usually use, um, canned beans, peas, cereal, all that wonderful stuff we want to have, crackers, baby cereal. And also, I want to mention that if you have monetary donation also, that would always, always be welcome. So I, I encourage you that if you have any of that stuff anyway, please let me know, contact myself, um, Sister Hodge or Sister Ann. Um, and what's the other Ann, the tall Ann? Last name, <laughs> Allen, thank you, Sister Anna Allen. That's what, um, those are the three people if you can just contact us and let us know please. Thank you very much. Is there anything that I'm missing? I think that's about it. Thank you and God bless you. Woo! Is anybody tired? Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you I'm tired. <laughs> but God is good. Amen. It's not the taste of shallow anymore. <laughs> but God is good. 300. I never need a microphone. 300 people came through here on a day like this. Mm -hmm. Don't play with God. That's right. 38 units of blood. Three people gave double units. Give God a hand clap. Amen. Because he's worthy to be praised. So we've started something in this community, right? Yes. And so we're not done. We still have a work to do. Revelation series is coming up. We expect your participation in that Amen. by telling, bringing someone with you, bringing people from your neighborhood, and telling others about what's happening here. Because we want to prepare people. Jesus is coming. Yes. Yes. And we want as many that would like to go to go with him. Yes. I'm going. How about you? Amen. 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 Now, we're going to show a couple pictures real quick and then get out of the way. And we want to thank all those that participated at the Taste of Shiloh, whether you were in the planning team. We'd like the planning team to please stand up. Amen. Please stand up. Amen. To God be the glory. Please stand up so you can get your props today. <laughs> God is good. Thank you so much. I know the emails. Lord have mercy. You will get just a few more from me. But You've done a wonderful job. God has given you strength. We're not done. We're still got a work to do. The right hand to the gospel is what? The health message. Yes. Right? So we've got a lot to do here. Now, if you've participated at all, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much for coming out on a day that really was nasty and you just wanted to cover your heads up. Um, thank you for just you know, singing those songs on Sabbath with us and getting pumped up for the Taste of Shiloh. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, who was our marketing director, I guess. <laughs> well, what, what I would like to say is I want to ask our, I want to ask our planning committee to please stand again. If you are on the planning committee and you received an email from Sister Pauline Cook, you know who you are. Everybody in here. <laughs> Please stand. And I'm going to ask Sister Hope to come up at this time. Um, what I want to say is um, Sister Cook has been a joy to work with in planning this event. When I first started Taster Shiloh, I was the communications leader, and I just felt like we needed to have some type of church bazaar, a church fair, a church event to welcome the community into Shiloh so they can come and learn about the health, health message, see who we are, and meet us. And that year, it was difficult for me because it was 2006, that was nine years ago, and right before I had Spencer. So Taste of Shiloh was my first baby. <laughs> so all the planning was kind of getting, you know, scary, and I was concerned, you know, it was my first pregnancy and all that stuff. And I told Sister Cook, after I engaged her, I said, I don't think we should do it. She said, no, we have to do it. We have to do this. I'll co-chair. I will do everything. 
And she literally did. We had meeting after meeting, planning event after planning event to do our first Taste of Shiloh. I don't know how many people were here and remember that 2006 event. We did it in 2007, we did it in 2009, and I hope you understand why we had to take a hiatus. <laughs> but to pick it back up again, the same thing happened. Sister Cook, she knew I had just too much on my plate, and she said, we have to do this, I'll do everything. <laughs> So here we are again, and Sister Cook, I just want to thank you for everything that you did Amen. to plan this event, to work with the whole church, to be passionate about bringing the community in to meet us. And on behalf of the planning committee, I wanted to present you with this token of our appreciation. And we just, we love you. We just thank you so much for everything that you've done. And we know that the Lord's work will go on on behalf of Shiloh and this particular event and everything that we plan because we know we have people like Sister Cook who are willing to work so hard to make sure that people meet us and they meet God. Thank you. It's always a blessing to have dedicated servants of the Lord in our church. Amen? Amen. Yeah, Sister Cook, uh, we, again, we are so grateful for you and your dedication. She, she had us to rally the Pathfinders, and uh, they also went out and uh, handed out tracks, and they covered 17 buildings of an apartment complex. Last, so, I, I, again, thanks to her support for that. Tomorrow is a very critical day for our young people in terms of our fundraiser. Many of you have been contacted by our young people in terms of our citrus fruit sale. To, we've already placed the order and it will be coming in, in another week or so, but many of you have not turned in your order forms, your funds. Please, we need you to do that tomorrow so we can get this all reconciled. So we have our regular club meeting for both Pathfinders and Adventurers. Uh, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we'll be there. Uh, so we'll have staff available to collect your orders. It's not too late if, you've or, if you think it's too late, you can still turn it in, but tomorrow we have to get it all collected along with the funds so we can go in ahead and do this. This is the biggest fundraiser for our young people, amen? And it's a way for us to be able to do things for them that sometimes because of finances we can't do. We never would like to say no to our young people because the funds are not there. So this is a way for us to be able to do that. So we are pleading with you and asking you uh, to see us and make sure we can get that all taken care of by tomorrow. God bless. I want to thank uh, Brother Daly. Stand, just stand up, Brother Daly. Now, Brother Daly came and put our electric work in just... Uh, so that we could have the taste of Shiloh. And, uh, quietly brought his little crew in, a one man, and uh, set up a temporary system. We got it all in this church. Come on, say man, and Lord, anything we need. Well, one thing I want us to do, one thing. Now we've got to go warn a world that Jesus is soon to come. That's the, that's the burden on my soul at the present time. Last week, I was, I understood that um, a friend of mine informed me, this young man, I don't know what he did, but he was being chased by his associates. And um, he happened to, as he was running, slip and fell. When his associates caught up with him, they ended his life. And I don't know how to say this to our young people over and over again, that outside of Jesus, there is nothing promised to you but a bad time. I just want to plead with you. I'm sure this young man thought he was in good company when he was hanging around with those who were just like him. But I want you to know that the devil plays games. And he may lead you to think that friendships outside of Jesus are okay until they go awry, awry. Then you will find out what the true nature of every human being is if God doesn't have a hold of them. 
This is about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I believe the Lord saved my life, earrings and all, pressed hair and all. I believe the Lord saved my life so I could tell you, don't try it. I've been there, done that. Been there, done that. And so I want to encourage your heart. Please stay with Jesus. Please, young folks, I'm begging you, please. Just heard that uh, one of our, my uh, conference committee members, a lady I used to pastor, just got a call. A young man in college is her grandson. He wasn't the target for getting killed. It was another guy he was with. This 19-year-old is dead today. He just got killed the other day. <laughs> at school in college. Wrong crowd. I was downtown the other day, uh, had to go to a function. And I just, I'm hurting folks. That's why we got to tell people. Young people just buck wild. No direction. Good education, no direction. And I said, how are we going to tell them? How are we going to tell them? And so my plea to you is, sometimes my voice is too old for them to listen to. But your voice is young enough for them to listen to. And these young people your age need to know about Jesus. And the only way some of them are going to know is that you tell them. You tell them. So come on, let's, let's, let's get all into this thing now. Because it's just about over. It's just about over, y'all. It's just about over. I want to say thank you again, Shiloh, for your sacrifice that you've made. A lot of money spent, but it's well worth it. Every dime. And folk, at this present time, everybody's dollars count. We need everybody support. Everybody supporting. Everybody. I don't care how meager your funds are, they help. We don't want the church to stop at nothing when it comes to ministry. Nothing whatsoever. However, if we keep going in the direction we go, we will have to stop ministries. Now that would hurt my soul. So let's not stop giving. And those who are not giving, I want to encourage you, please be faithful to God. Please be faithful. Let's do all we can to do what God says so that we can move this thing forward. Is that all right? We're in partnership together. Business meeting you heard, please, we need you as we make plans, as you listen to what's going on, what's happening, you ask your questions. Please remember as we have that business meeting next week that... Um, We'll be able to touch bases. A prophecy seminar coming up. Amen. As we are about ready now to really get to digging into the word. What is God saying to his people in these last days? You'll hear more about that later on. All right? At the end of this month, we're going to be having our baptism. Amen. And there are those individuals who have already consented to be baptized. And I want to say this to our parents. Uh, in talking with Ella Wallace uh, last week, he mentioned something that it's worth repeating. When it was time to get baptized, he told us about a friend of his that his parents didn't let him get baptized at that time. He got baptized. As a result of that, he is here today. His friend is no longer living, never was baptized. Parents, Let's push our children, encourage our children in the way of the Lord. How old should they be to make this decision? As old enough as they want to make this decision. I don't know where we get to have to be a certain age to do this. And as long as they know and love Jesus, we want to encourage them in the way of God. They need to know that they're taking a stand on the side of Christ. And as Brother Cook, um, Brother Clark is uh, running our Bible class for our kids. We need you to help us in preparing them for baptism at the end. And those others, you need to see us who want to become a member of our church. I say that with no apology whatsoever. 
I believe God called you here, and God has commissioned this church to take care of you while you're here. Amen. We grow Christians in this place. That's what we do, and we want to be of encouragement to you. Let's have a wonderful time in worshiping God this day. How about our children? Aren't they wonderful? Look at them. Uh, don't they make you fall in love with them all over again? Yeah, well, yeah. I heard some of yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do. I would take it all. You were once there, too. You remember that. You just, it was just yesterday you were there. And we are running after you, too. So let's keep our kids encouraged. Folks, one last thing. It's on my heart. We got to have a church school. Amen. Got to have a school. We've got a year to plan this, but we've got to have a school. Amen. Our kids got to be trained of the Lord. Amen. And when you see as we go through these prophecy seminars, our kids got to be taught along with education. They got to be taught the truth of the Bible so they can stand when it comes time to stand. God bless you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Ellie Nyalete. This is my wife. I'm Leah Nyalete. Um, do we have any visitors today, this morning? If we have any visitors, please stand up. Amen. Amen. Would you please state your name, where you're from, and who invited you? Good morning. I am Violet Femel, and I'm here because of Lisa Sun. And my Sister Rigsby, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm staying with Sister Sharon. Amen. Good morning. My name is Omar Odom. <clears throat> I'm from South Carolina, and um, we just visited. Amen. 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 Good morning. My name is Odero, and I'm here with my family, and we're visiting here also. We're here in this area of Smyrna, Georgia. Amen. I'm Chantelle Brown from West End Seventh Day Adventist Church. Amen. This is Troy and this is Sare. Happy Sabbath. Amen. My name is Thomas. I'm from West End Seventh Day Adventist Church. Amen. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Dowdy. I am living at Woodstock. Hello, my name is Natalie Harris, and I attend Bethany SCA Church, and I attend um, Kennesaw State University. Amen. Good morning, I'm Natalie Harris' mom. I am Charlize Harris, and I too attend Bethany, and we're joining you all today, trying to hope to find her a local church in the area while she goes to Kennesaw. So I called Anthony, Anthony Harris and Cheryl Harris last night. Let them know we're going to be here, and hopefully we can meet some other college students or young students here to keep her um, rooted. Amen. We, we want to thank you all for coming to uh, worship with us today. Uh, we are grateful that you are here. Um, as you can see, we have a very vibrant church. We have great leaders. We have hardworking people working for the kingdom of God. And we would like to keep you. Please, if you're looking for a church, this is it. Um, so you can see we, we, we are family here, and we would love to have you as part of our family. Shall we all rise and welcome our guests in our own shallow way? Amen.
Shout to the Lord with joy, everyone on earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come to him with songs of joy. I want you to realize that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people. We are the sheep belonging to his flock. Give thanks as you enter the gates of his temple. Give praise as you enter his courtyards. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The Lord is good. His faithful love continues forever. It will last for a long time to come. Amen. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you have made for us to worship you. Father, we thank you for bringing us into this place because it's here where you design it so where we can fellowship with you. Now, Father, accept our worship, accept our praise. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
just can't understand why you loved us so much. We are so blessed. We just can't find a Good morning, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to church today. And um, as you are aware, today is Education Day. And um, we are very blessed to be not only in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we are blessed because of everything that's available to us, um, which I will talk about uh, in a few minutes. So the Education Department believes that we exist to educate not just for success on earth, but for eternity, hence our motto, which Sister Batiste is credited with coming up with, educating for eternity. 
And the book Education states that true education means more than pursuing a certain course of study. It has to do with the whole person and with the whole period of existence possible to human beings. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. And that's what we try to do here at Shiloh. Just wanted to tell you about a few of the things that our education department has been involved in. So we have given scholarships, which include tuition assistance to our students. We have also uh, participated in the three-way scholarship where Shallow gives a portion, the conference gives a portion, and the union gives a portion, and that's why it's called the three-way scholarship. We've also participated in volunteer um, events. We've had two volunteer events at Project Open Hand, and you will see pictures of that later on. Uh, Sister Jackie Forbes has also done a presentation for students who are juniors or seniors in college about the college ap application process, not only for the students, but for the parents as well. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we are blessed to have choices when it comes to choosing educational institutions. Now our institutions are by no means perfect because negative things do happen on our campuses, but not to the extent that they occur on other colleges. Um, I remember a friend of mine telling me years ago when my, kid, my, my kids went to public school and she said, when you're considering college, please think about sending them to a Seventh-day Adventist institution. She said they will be amongst like-minded people. Um, if they're looking for a mate, they have several to choose from. <laughs> um, and our colleges offer many of the protections that other institutions do not offer. There's a curfew. Um, they have opportunities for missionary ser service. Um, we have gender specific dorms, uh, worship services that they have to attend. I know I slept better at night when my older son was in an Adventist institution, and I sleep very well at night knowing that Zach is in a Seventh-day Adventist institution because he has to be in the dorm by a certain time. Um, I wanted to share some very short videos with you about some of the things that students can encounter on non-Seventh-day Adventist institutions. Now remember I said that our institutions are by no way perfect, but they do offer us some protections that public institutions do not. The first video um, is about college freshmen going to college for the first time and some of the things they can encounter. Moved in, so we're just setting our goals and vision and priority for the year. A new school year starts tomorrow at Old Dominion, but these three signs have already shined an unwanted spotlight on the university. Our main worry was the freshmen who are moving in. You know, it's their first day coming to college. And from new students to upperclassmen. I just thought it was a bit degrading and, you know, not very appropriate. It's a day they'll likely never forget. I think the perception that was there when they were moving in is that this is not a welcoming environment, nor do we take a approach to combating sexual assault, which is completely not true. Student government president Chris Indiratu says the signs went up Friday morning and it didn't take long for the word to spread. I know me personally, I had friends that texted me the picture. And Social media erupted soon after with people's response to the banners. The university quick to speak out against the display. And we said we have to do something about this. I am outraged are the words from university president John Broderick. He sent a letter to the campus community reiterating a zero tolerance policy against sexual assault and harassment. We need to reach out to every part of campus still. You know, there are still places we need to go and we need to continue the efforts because we need to reach as many people as possible. Brett Bolger appears in a video released by the school in the wake of the banners. The actions taken by a few individuals this week certainly do not represent the position of the university or Old Dominion students. It's a message about a new campaign aimed at combating sexual harassment on campus. They say this weekend's events show them one thing for sure, that there's still more work to be done. Increase education, increase awareness, and work on prevention. 
and the Student Government Association says those living in the home on 43rd Street are students at ODU. The university president says the next step will be a complete review of the situation to determine if disciplinary action is necessary. I'm Notice the banner said, drop your freshman daughters off here. You want to have fun and mom, you can come too. Um, the second video is about drinking on college campuses. He had a couple of drinks and took a half ecstasy. They kept him alive on machines for the next day. The doctors called us in and told us that he was not going to recover. I'm here to talk to the kids who are in college about the epidemic and the dangers of binge drinking. It's the social culture that exists on college campuses and there's no escaping it. Everyone gets sucked into it and you really, yeah, you just have to look out for yourself. They don't realize the power of alcohol. They're still youthful, they believe they're immortal. They need to be uh, respectful of what alcohol can do to the blood system, how it starts to impair good judgment. It takes some time to get into your bloodstream and it creeps up on you. They think they can still drink more and believe that they're okay. By the time you've had two or three shots, you're pretty much wasted. Alcohol still continues to climb in your blood system as it continues to be absorbed in your stomach for a period of time long after you've been drinking. Under no circumstances are you to get into a car after you've had any alcohol on your lips. It's not worth risking your own well-being and your own sanity for the rest of your life to put yourself in that situation. And the third video is about co-ed bathrooms. I go to college too. College is a place where many young adults go to further their education in hopes to get a job of their choice. Now, as we have been growing up, adults have been working very hard to make sure we're ready for our college years, but they seem to have left out a few very important details about college. Sometimes when you go to college, you have to live on the dorms, because, you know, not everyone can commute to two or for maybe eight hours of school at Mac every day. So you live on the dorms. Yeah, simple enough, right? And sometimes when you live on these dorms, you live on co-ed floors. Eh, no biggie, right? Girls mind their own business, guys mind their own business. It's all pretty good and they even mingle. You know, good for socializing, right? And you would imagine that with these co-ed floors, you would have a girl's bathroom and a boy's bathroom, right? Well, I guess sometimes that's just not the case, because here we have gender-neutral bathrooms. What's up with that, huh? I mean, come on, really. Like, we've grown up all our lives with separate bathrooms, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you get to share a bathroom with the guys. What? That, that's so gross, right? I mean, guys and girls in the same bathroom? Like, that's only something you should do when you're, like, married or have a bro sibling or brother and sister or something, then you share bathrooms with your opposite gender. That, that's like the only time, right? No, I guess not necessarily the case. But since we have these gender neutral bathrooms, now we, as girls, have a lot more things to worry about. We have to worry about guys walking in on us on accident when we're showering, and their hair. I mean, it was bad enough dealing with just girls' hair, but now we have to deal with guys' hair? Eesh. And and if guys shave and they're... Okay, I, you get the idea. <laughs> so, as STEM the Adventists, we are known for our hospitals and our educational institutions. Um, there is a brochure that we have to pass out, which was made by Sister Rose Heacock and she and Sister Cook worked on this. Um, if you would like a brochure, if you would go ahead and raise your hand, they will pass a brochure out to you. The, this has all of the accredited institutions in North America, some of the Adventist colleges and universities. The ones that are not accredited were not included on here, but that doesn't mean we don't recommend that you attend those. Um, you would have to make that choice. Um, 
And while they're doing that, we will just go ahead and share a few pictures with you of our volunteer events at Project Open Hand. Um, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank all of our students for participating, our homeschoolers, our public schoolers, those in private schools, all of you, thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Scripture reading is taken from Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child, child the way to go, and when he is old, it is not to depart from it. Sabbath, everyone. Okay. Um, now is our time of the service where we can all give back to what we got this week. Um, so let's all get our tithes and envelopes and our offerings ready for the uh, deacons to come again.
as we recall what God has done and how we've seen him move. If there's anybody here who's found him faithful, anybody here who knows he's able, say amen. If there's anybody here who's seen his power, anybody here brought through the fire, Anybody here found joy in the midst of sorrow, peace in the storm, hope for tomorrow, and you've seen it time and time again, just say amen. Sometimes through the darkness it gets hard to see But be bold and courageous and follow where he leads Greater is the one who's in us than he who's in the world So child of God remember the battle is the Lord If there's anybody Anybody here who knows he's able, say amen. If there's anybody here who's seen his power, anybody here brought through the fire, say amen. Anybody here found joy in the midst of sorrow, in the storm hope for tomorrow and you've seen it time and time again just say Cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he will, shall not destroy the fruits of your grounds, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, Lord, please just uh, bless the monies that were given today, and that they will be used to go towards your will.
testing. As you know, as we collect these funds, we're just trying to get ready for school. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank you for your giving. We're going to have ask God's blessing and, uh, on this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Please bless this offering and let it go towards something good and to bless someone or something. In your holy name I pray, amen. amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, boys and girls. Everyone have a good week at school? No? <laughs> um, we're going to read a memory text taken from 2 Kings 5, verse 14. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child, and he was clean. Can anyone guess the story we're going to talk about today? The guy that had um, leprosy, and he dipped his body in the Jordan River that was really dirty. <laughs> that's correct, that's correct. So, who's heard the story of Naaman? Of course, y'all have. Okay, so there was a man named Naaman, and he was a commander of the army for the king of Syria. He was also known as a hero of his country. But Naaman was sad. He had a terrible illness called leprosy. Who knows what leprosy is? Y'all are smart. Naaman's leprosy was getting worse and worse, and soon he had to leave his family. He was desperate to find a cure. A young Jewish girl who was taken captive during the war became a servant for Naaman's wife. She told Naaman's wife, There is a prophet of God in Samaria that could help heal Naaman. So... The king of Syria encouraged Naaman to go to Israel. Elisha heard of Naaman's illness and invited him to his house. Now Naaman went to Elisha's house with many gifts. Could you believe that? Many gifts? It, it wasn't even Christmas. It wasn't even his birthday. He brought many gifts. Elisha sends his servant to tell Naaman to go to the Jordan River and wash himself seven times. Now, Naaman wasn't happy that Elijah didn't come to see him, and Elijah didn't even take his gifts. Isn't that a shame? It's probably good gifts. Now, Naaman was wondering why he should go to the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River was nasty water. It was water you wouldn't want to drink. It was murky, dirty, black, maybe. <laughs> but... Naaman decided to go home. Now Naaman's servant asked him, if the prophet told you to do something great, would you have done it? Why not do the simple thing he told you to do? Would you go in the dirty water? Yeah. You would? Why, Eli? Because God said so. So Naaman went to the Jordan River and dipped seven times, and he was healed. How many times did he dip in the water? I thought he did once. Did he dip once? Yes. He did twice? Yes. He dipped six times. No. He dipped seven times? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if Naaman didn't follow Elisha's instructions, would his illness be cured from would his il illness be cured? Yes. He knew that in order for a man to come to him, he would need to humble himself and have simple faith. So, 
We have to have simple faith, just like Naaman did. Even though he didn't want to go in the water, he had faith that he would be healed. So remember, we have to obey our parents, and we have to obey God. So who would like to pray? Two volunteers. You. And we need a girl. Ladies first, bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, God, for giving us this um, this day and letting us be with you. And whatever we do, we'll obey you and obey your plan. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you each day. Thank you for healing story. Amen. You can go back to your seats now. church. We are the McPherson family and this is a time where everyone can participate. This is a time for prayer. And so if you have any special desires, special needs that you'd like to present before the Lord, we invite you at this time to come forward closer to the altar. children to be good in church and please help them to be good at the, with their parents at their house and at school. Please help the children to be safe 
on the road and please help them to not get in in any car accident. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, I continue to pray and I pray for the women of Shiloh. I pray that you'd be with all of us, Lord. I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to be open to the leading of your Holy Word. Help us to be the, our children's first educators and help us to lead and guide them in the way that they should go. Lord, I pray for all the women, young, old, that we will be what you have called us to be. I pray that you would rid us from all that is ailing us. There's so much hurt and so much pain that you would heal us from all our calamities, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we continue just a moment longer, Father. And I lift up all of the men and the families of this church, all of the members, each and every one of us here gathered in your house of prayer this morning, oh Lord. And we thank you for being the good God that that takes care of us day by day. And Lord, as we celebrate education, we thank you for your holy word. That, Lord, we know is the best education that there is available for all of us. The best directions that we can follow, the best information to learn about you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your holy word. We ask and pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each of the men and the fathers and the husbands the brothers of this church, O oh Lord, we ask and pray for your continued strength and direction. We ask and pray, Father, that you would bless each of the families in this church that is represented today. Whether the family is the size of one person or the size of 15 people, O oh Lord, we ask and pray for your continued covering and blessings over all of the families of our church. O oh Lord, we ask and pray that you would keep us under your close care. Lord, there are many amongst us that are that are in need of, of your special attention, from health, from, from finance, from, from just strength at home to strength at work. Lord, we ask and pray for your, your a special attention to help us through, oh Lord. Father, bless us. Bless us all as your children as we're gathered together this morning before you. Keep us under your care. Forgive us of our sins, O oh Lord, because, Lord, without your forgiveness, what hope would we have? But you gave us the hope of Jesus to cover all of our sins, and we thank you for that great sacrifice. Lord, this morning we pray in a special way for the speaker of the hour, that you would give words from on high to encourage us, to strengthen us, and direct us. So, Father, this morning, bless us with a special Sabbath day's blessing and continue to keep us until that great day when Jesus shall return to save all of us as his children. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.
So our speaker today is Dr. John Patrickson, and I will just read his bio, and then after that, I'll tell you about the real John Patrickson. Um, Dr. Patrickson was born in Mandeville, Jamaica. He's a graduate of West Indies College, which is now Northern Caribbean University, and Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree. He received his doctorate from Howard University School of Medicine, the Department of Physiology and Biophysics with a specialty in respiratory physiology and neuroscience. His postgraduate studies were in brain research at Uniform Services University at Bethesda, in Bethesda, Maryland. He taught at Loma Linda University in the School of Medicine, and he taught neuroscience to medical and dental students, and he developed the neuroscience curriculum there. In 1991, he moved to Morehouse School of Medicine, and he's the co-founder of the Neuroscience Institute Brain Research. He developed the neurobiology curriculum, and he won the Teacher of the Year Award 15 times. He's the first elder at West End SDA Church and has been for the past 10 years. He has three adult children, Jason, Deidre, and Elise, and two grandchildren. His favorite text is, Now are we the sons of God, 1 John 3, verse 2. So now I'm going to tell you about the person I know. So I first met Dr. Patrickson about 20 years ago when my husband introduced me to him um, because their families have known each other their whole lives. And as his bio said, he was born in Mandeville, Jamaica, um, which is where Northern Caribbean University is located and where the Reynolds family lived in Mandeville as well. And so they lived in close enough proximity to each other where they would have Sabbath evening vespers together a lot, and, okay, and on occasion, they had Sabbath lunch. And my husband talks about Mrs. Patrickson's fried chicken and a baked dessert that she would make. Um, and here's what my mother-in-law would say. She would say, I remember the Patricksons going to church and Sister Patrickson would have the three girls and, Dr. and Mr. Pat would have John on his shoulders and they would walk to church. Um, they would often take college students home for lunch and um, my husband describes the family as being a really nice family. Well, I know John as a really nice man. He's very down to earth despite his credentials. Um, he, as soon as you meet him, you'll feel like you've known him your whole life. And he has come to this church many times. He's been a presenter at this church many times. And so you've experienced his sense of humor and just how nice he is. So after Highest Praise Sings, the next voice you will hear will be Dr. John Patrickson.
Church family, let's give your hands to your children again. Magnificent, magnificent, magnificent. It's always a joy to worship with you. It's like coming home. So many familiar faces, so many familiar faces. I want to say thank you to Pastor Barber. Always let me feel so much at home. Thank you so much, so much. And to Anne, thanks for the invitation, and here I am, here I am. Um, I was thinking I want to put this mic elsewhere, or I don't know. I'm going to take you to some fundamentals relative to teaching our children. Uh, our theme this morning for or program, where is it? I was just looking at educating for education, educating for eternity, educating for eternity. Um, when we think of it, when we think of it, the greatest thing that we can do for children is educating them with the information that is necessary for a successful life here and for the hereafter. I cannot overemphasize it. But before I begin, let's just bow our heads for a moment and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. This is your hour. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is in our midst. Now Holy Spirit, teach us Open our hearts to receive that which you have prepared for us. We need to hear from you today. Endow our thoughts, our minds with your presence, with your words. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. One of the challenges we have, I'm going to speak to you today, to you today from the perspective of a parent. And... Um, in so doing, we'll get an insight, perhaps, of how to best teach our children. One of the things that we're always, as parents, that we are somewhat, I wouldn't say overwhelmed, but concerned about is, I hope when my children leave my presence, they are equipped to stand. When nobody is watching, they stand. When the influences are there, they will stand. Uh, that has been the question that parents have always had. And when we look at the Bible, we find that back then it was truly the same. I think it's rather accurate when Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. Different flavor but it's the same stuff. No matter where you are in time, the concerns are always the same. In scripture, I observe a few things that I want us to pay attention to. In our children's story, it was said, and we're reminded, that here is a little girl who was taken from home, forcibly, young girl, into now the house of Naaman. And as you know, she remained faithful to that which she was taught. To the point that when she spoke, her mistress listened. She had authenticity in her message based on her attitude and diligence. Can you imagine this young lady in the presence of Naaman's house, as she was given different duties to do, how well she performed it, to the point that when she said, oh, if my master could meet the prophet, they said, speak, sweetheart, what are you saying? And you know the rest of the story. What this little girl experienced, it's similar to what Daniel experienced. Here again, Daniel and his companions were taken forcibly. 
brought into a land that they knew not, and you know the story well, the unique thing about Daniel and his three companions was that they stood. They could not be shaken. By the way, you do remember that there were a lot of Israelites present. When the statue was, was erected, what were they doing? They were praying. But they stood. What about Joseph? Found himself betrayed by his brothers. Found himself in Egypt. Yet, the spirituality of Joseph was of such that Joseph will even declare, I cannot do anything that displeases God. Now, I think, for me, that's where I want my children to be. The spirituality of Naaman's slave girl, the spirituality and insight of Daniel, the spirituality and the insight of the three Hebrews, and yes, the spirituality of Joseph. Now, notice that all these persons I've mentioned have show us that they have extraordinary work ethics. They were diligent, yet they were coming from a home or country where Israel was suffering from apostasy. The true God was neglected and they were worshiping whoever and whatever they choose to. Yet, in that milieu, and yet in that environment, we find young people moving away from, forcibly, if you will. And yet, what they had been taught, who they were, stood. Young people away from home at a young age, yet anchored. If I should title what I'm going to speak about today is Young Yet Anchored. Young Yet Anchored. The question is, how do we train our children to be firmly anchored? You know, it's very interesting. When you look at the animal kingdom, there are those with, we call them vertebrates and invertebrates. Vertebrates are those with a background. They have a spine. Invertebrates are all the others, the insects and all those guys and the worms. One of the things you observe with them is that there are instinctive or innate behavior that they have. Yet some have to be taught. Some are pre-wired, yet some need parenting. Are you with me? The spider, for example. Parenting ends when the eggs hatch. The mom knits a little bag, lay the eggs in, complete the net, and she stands in the corner. When the eggs hatch, she's gone. But the babies know just what to do to survive. By the way, you notice that you never see spiders going to webbing school. <laughs> How do I spin an excellent web? It's all innate. Don't need a parent, yet equipped to survive. I'm a, I just love watching nature so shows, for that matter, nature programs. It's amazing. How is it the salmon, those spawn way upstream, ultimately find itself in deep waters within the ocean? Yet, when it's time for eggs to be laid, for the new generation, they will find where the opening to that river is. There are no other fish will call them and say, it is spawning time. Here is your GPS. Let's begin and give the date. 
they will all leave the same time, find the beginning of the river. Remember, they're in the huge ocean. And where they go, they go for miles, way out there. But at the appointed time, here they come. Up the river they go. Up the falls they go. Exactly to the very place where their life began. How did they find that? He made sure he wrote it in their DNA. He wrote it in their DNA. I look at the turtle, for example. When mom digs the little hole in the sand, lays her eggs, and gingerly covers it, she's gone out in the deep ocean. And when those eggs hatch and those little rascals come out on the surface, if you observe them carefully, the land mass is this way, the ocean is that way, and they all head for the ocean. No elementary school, no mom to teach them, children follow me, but they know exactly where to go. And when it is time for, th for them, for those to lay eggs, they don't ask mom. They go exactly where they were hatched and do the same. God has already written it on their DNA. But there's a different thing I observe. For those whose behaviors are extremely complex, they have to be taught. If you look at the lion, you look with pride and you look at how skillful they are at hunting. If the young ones, if the cubs are not taught to hunt, they can't hunt. They have the capacity to hunt, but how to hunt has to be taught. Are you with me? Have to be taught. And what we observe is when you look at mammals, those you know who what mammals are. When you look at them and you go up the scale and look at their capacity to learn, the ultimate is man. And I think it's rather ironic, ironic, very, very ironic, that when we look at their nervous system from the worm, the insect, just a few nerve nets, a few cells, that's all that's necessary to do all the complex things they do. When you look at mammals, you have something you call a brain. And when you go up the line of complexity, the larger the brain gets. But the interesting thing is, where the brain is most complex, parenting is of utmost importance. Let's look at men. Once that baby is born, it's the most helpless little thing you'll ever find. And you have to teach them everything that you know to equip them to be successful more than just surviving. That is, more than just getting a job in this world. More than just getting a job. They have to be taught. And as a matter of fact, um, how long children stay with us? <laughs> 21, and they're after college. 21. Think about it. Between 0 to 21, between 0 to 18, they need input. Large capacity to learn but they must be taught. Are you with me? They must be taught. The capacity to learn, the capacity to learn, when you think about it, there are three dimensions, I would call it. First one is imitation. Second, information. And the third, insight. Say it again. Imitation, information, Insight. 
those with the greatest capacity, brain capacity, one of the things what they learn is by imitation. Children learn to talk by imitating you. The sounds they, they hear, they start to mimic them. The behavior they develop is by what? Imitation. In other words, we copy our parents. And of course, some parents hope that didn't happen. Because some of the things they have copied are the things you thought they never saw. But children learn by mimicking, yes, copying you. They also learn by information. And information meaning knowledge communicated. Knowledge gained through study, communication, research, and instruction. It is of utmost importance to know that the ability to think is what God has given you. But how you think is based on the information that you have received. Are you with me? The capacity to learn, the capacity to create thoughts are manipulated, if you will, are generated by information. And the third one, as mentioned, is insight. And if you actually look for a definition for insight, I got one for you. An instance of apprehending the true nature of a thing, especially through intuitive understanding. It's also pertaining to mental vision, i.e. imagination or discernment, the faculty of being able to see the character or underlining truth. In other words, insight means wisdom. So we have three of them. Imitation, information, insight. As a matter of fact, that's how God designed us. That's his plan. He did not design us like the spider. Parents, how wonderful would that be? Really, let's think about it. How wonderful. I watched those things. I said, wow. All we had to do is just bring them here and tell you, go right ahead. And we have freedom. For no. And unlike the cheetah who stays with mom for two years, maybe three, and it's over, ours stays for forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. You get the idea. You get the idea. However, the point I'm making here is that's God's plan. That's God's design. When God made man, he made him in his, in his image. And in making him, he placed in him the capacity to imitate. The capacity to receive information. And the capacity to create insight or to have insight. When you create it, as a matter of fact, when we think about it, information will dictate your perception. In other words, the way you see things. Therefore, therefore, when we look at information, when we notice its impact on perception, hence how you interact with information, it also will determine your insight, hence the decisions that you make. Let's look at Adam. When God created Adam, he created him with a capacity, a mental capacity to absorb a lot of information. By the way, when we look at the human brain, it's an overkill. We got too much brain for what we do. Too much. 
Well, you see, the thing is, God designed our brains to live forever. That's where it began with Adam. He wouldn't have. He did not plan, plan to regenerate and give him a new brain. Five million years later, he gave him a brain that had the capacity to learn forever. So I hope you can get, get, get your mind around that, right? Get your mind around that. When you get to heaven, you, the, the, you will be learning from him and the environment around you forever. Never forgetting, always receiving, always processing, and you're saying, oh, you're awesome. You are absolute. Sometimes I get carried away. I love fruits. I love mangoes. And sometimes you get a mango and you bite it. Just, mm, that thing is good. Then he says, he says, you have not tasted anything yet. No. <laughs> Can you imagine when you're up there and you bite something, a mango so big, you're wondering, is this a mango? And when you bite in that thing, you have never tasted anything like that. You just look at him and you say, now you understand why praises go to him continuously. Yes. And for us, being here with what we're going through, everything you touch, everything you experience up there, you just going to simply just blow your mind. And you look at him and you say, if it wasn't for you, where would we be? And while I'm on that, while I'm on that, and when he raised his hand and that wonderful smile, in his hands you saw the prince. I always wondered why he kept the prince. When he healed, and that's not my sermon, when he healed anyone with a leprosy, they were spotless. Their skin was a baby's. Yet, after the crucifixion, and he came forth, he still has a scar. Look right through it, you can see it. I got it here, and I got it here. Oh, when I see my hands, I see you. That's what God says. When I see my hands, I see you. And this represents that there is nothing that I would not submit myself to to get you here. No wonder you're looking at him and you're saying, oh, you... To say you're awesome, well, ah. Anyway, let's go back to what we're supposed to talk about. Mm. When God created Adam, he created him with a mental capacity. Created mental capacity. A mental capacity. The Bible said he would go to Adam in the cool of the day, and he would talk with him. You imagine the wisdom of God. And when he talked to Adam, Adam is right there. Right there. He can comprehend what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, well, I'm not going there. I'm just leave it. <laughs> just leave it. I, I got to stay, with, I gotta stay with, what I, with what I intend. I got to stay with what I intend. Whatever I say, what I intend. So God made man in his own image with the capability of receiving information from his master. But notice, all three are present. Adam was, was designed to learn by imitation, information, and insight. Adam then, therefore, imitation. Adam, therefore, by association with God, would just simply imitate him. That's all he knows. He's a copier. Yeah. He's a copier. I duplicate. That's why God says, if you watch me, you, if by seeing, you are changed. Yeah. By observing me continuously, you come like me. You see it with your children, who they hang around, 
There they are. You wonderful child when you try so hard and he gets in the right groove. You notice he starts talking differently. Trying to sound like them. Then you know the rest of the story. Walk like them. Your pants have no loops no more. See what I'm getting at? Because we are copiers. We mimic. And the enemy uses that. He knows all this, so he plays with you. So here comes Adam. He was designed to mimic, to copy. Copy who? Copy me. So when you look at Adam, he walks like God. He does what God does. Because that's what daddy does. You with me? That's what daddy does. Then he also taught him by information. He will download his thoughts to Adam. Imagine that. All the things Adam's brain was like a sponge, like our children. And all God would just give it to him all day long. All day long. Information. Notice, you walk like me, you talk like me, that's Adam and God, and when you open your mouth, you sound like me. You sound like me. Little God. Big G, little G. Big G, little G. And he just look at it and say, oh, that's my children. They're just like their daddy. Are you with me? Just like their daddy. With that, in, with that, the capacity to think, the capacity to generate thoughts. That's Adam. And Adam, out of his mouth, will come such great and profound thoughts that God will just smile and say, that's my boy. Because the human mind will pull that information in, process it, generate new thought, even go abstract, if you will, and come up with something that perhaps no one else has ever thought of before. He has made us so. No wonder he tell, told Adam and Eve when he created the earth. When he finished, he said, take the earth, go finish it. Go complete it. Go complete it. This is your playground. Go complete it. So God has placed that within us. Learning by imitation, information, and the creation of great insight. By the way, you know you learn from your insights. From those unique thoughts. They're yours. And when you act on them and see the outcome, they become you. As a matter of fact, when we look at Jesus, it's no different than Adam. I'll just give you a good example. Imitation. Let's listen to what he had to say. He is perfect at copying. Perfect at mimicking. In John chapter 5 and verse 19, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, most assuredly, I am saying unto you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he see the father do for those things which he doeth, these things also does the son likewise. I like amplified version. Let me read it again. I assure you most solemnly the son can do nothing of himself, of his own accord, that is, unless it is something he sees the father doing, or whatever thing his father does, the son, in turn, do it likewise. No wonder he spent so much time with that, with his father. No information. And as a matter of fact, I copy and do what he does. Information. 
knowledge gained by communication. Jesus, by the information given him, he knew for sure who he is. Even when the enemy came to him and said, if you are who you say you are, do this. He said, I don't have to prove it to you. He knew who he was, who he is. He says, based on the information he has gotten, he says, I know my purpose. I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to do what? Do the will of him who what? Who sent me. Now, there's a little thing one needs to look at. The whole idea of information. What, would Je what, what Jesus actually did with information? I'll read something to you. Jesus speaking from John chapter 10, verse seven, 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore does the Father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No man take it from me, but I lay it down by myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This is a clincher. This commandment I received of my father. Gods can't die. But I am telling you, his father says, you are in the flesh. I'm telling you something now, son. No one can take your life from you. You've got it. You have the power to take it down, to lay it down, or take it up again. What Christ was about to do, he has never been there before. Right. Yet he went with confidence. Why? Daddy said so. Information will dictate my behavior. Because you said, I can lay it down. Because you said, I'll take it up. Let's go. I'm good to go. Information. Information will actually manipulate your thought process. It will change it based on the information you're receiving. And you look at him. He received it from his father. He absorbed it and said, it's fine with me. And as you know, as the Bible said, he walked the wine press knowing that what his father had said was true. Insight. When you think of insight concerning Jesus, he was, he was just simply amazing. That's why people just sat there all day listening to him. What? The same scripture but when he read it and explained it, they saw something they've never seen before. Insight. That measure of wisdom. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees were always after him. Always, always after him. And they said, guys, tell you what. You guys are like the CIA. Stay on him. Stay on him. Take notes when he mess up because he's way out there, way out there. And they would stay with him day after day. And when the time was past that they need to report, when they got themselves together and could finally break away from him, Jesus that is, when they went back and the Pharisees said, tell me what you've got on him, they just shook their heads. Never a man spake as this man. Insight. That even your critics will be completely disarmed as they listen to the words of, insight, of wisdom from your mouth. That's Jesus. Our children. The essence of what I want to talk about. Our children like Adam has the physical and the spiritual. There must be a balance. Our educational system, our educational system out there, the best that there is, 
just develop one component. Facts, facts, facts. But there's another side, the spiritual side of you, which most times go completely neglected. That's why you find young people, though smart, don't know what their purpose is. Their spirituality is completely dormant, not being developed. Parents, we have to make sure that what we teach our children addresses both the spiritual and the physical. Our children learn by imitation, information, and insight. Imitation, as I mentioned before, copying and mimic. Your children copy you. It's a dangerous thing, isn't it? Isn't that way? Um, <laughs> isn't it amazing sometimes when we as adults say something, you hear your dad or your mom saying it all over again? Imitation. Imitation. So therefore, it becomes very important then how we live among our children. Because without script, they are copying you. Without explanation, they are receiving what you are doing. How do you respond to stress? Is how they will respond to stress. What is your formula <laughs> for uncoupling your challenges? That too, they observe you very carefully. You know, children watch you when you play, but they watch you when you're stressed. Then the real you shows up, and they know. Dads, are your son respectful? Or let me re rephrase this. Will your son be respectful to their wives? See, daddy do? I do. Mom, likewise. Even your influence on your son. You get them driving at. Your influence on your daughters. They are copying us. And it's always amazing to me that children who are brought up in homes where Things weren't so good. They end up generally doing the same thing to their family. They felt the pain, they now apply the pain. Copying. Therefore, where we as parents receive our information is of utmost importance, as because your children, your children, they learn not only by imitation, but also via information, information. Thus, we need to take the time to teach them. Be deliberate in your teaching process. I will ask you, therefore, what is your source of information to your children? They are absorbing every day. What is the source of information to them? The enemy is a very smart rascal. If I can keep mommy and daddy busy, even doing the right thing, that they don't even have time to teach, they mimic without information. And then, but they are always seeking information. There is the television, source of information. They are friends. Source of information. Then now we have everything, are, they are online, and you watch these kids now, from the little things. They got your phone, they know to do what, the phone, and I even know what to do with my phone. They get the iPad, they go away, you don't even understand what they're doing. They are there. It's another source of information. Unseen, unedited, and our child's receive it. As parents, as parents, we must make sure that the information our children receive 
is of utmost import is of utmost important because it will shape their perception of things how they do things how they interact with things how they see the world make sure you're teaching them truth capital T not small t small t truth is what the world gives that T, that truth, is truth mixed with error. As a matter of fact, let's think about it. Most of us, we live by the truth they taught us in college, elsewhere, to live a certain life, to gain something. Let me ask you, of all the things you have inspired for, for all the dreams you had, yet you use the tools given to you are you happy with where you are in life? If somebody told you 20 years ago, you'll be right here, right now, in life, doing what you do, would you drink the Kool-Aid? You get what I'm driving at. But when we have the right information, we have truth. You can rely on it, and it always will work for you. Always. Always. Now, <laughs> what children are looking for is what I would consider congruency in behavior and information. By that mean, there must be agreement with the information that you are giving me with the behavior you are displaying to me. Yes. Are you with me? It's not what you are saying. God is good. God provides. Yet when it's difficult, I do not see it in your behavior. I do not see it in your behavior. There must be a, an agreement with both. We must not be schizophrenic in our thinking. We must think in wholeness. And with the information we have given them, it will predicate or have great impact upon their insight, their, in, their, their wisdom, and therefore will have a profound effect upon their decision making. By the way, when you're making a decision, maybe you're not aware of it, to make a decision your mind will reach back in all the recesses of your mind, your memory, pull all pertinent information, and then you do your quick analysis, and you make your decision. If the information you had was of such, I can see your decision. That's why the input is so important, because it, it will impact your decision making. That's why God says, spend time with me. As a matter of fact, Jesus gave this parable about the, um, the sower went out to sow about the seed. And he says the seed represents what? The word. And you notice for all those examples, there is a force out there what wants to make sure his word does not get inside here because it will impact your thoughts. It will impact your behavior, and it will profoundly change the way you make decisions. So if I can keep him out, keep his thoughts out, I got you. How many times you try so hard, you thought this was the right decision, and you come and get bitten by it. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the bite of death. Your decision making. Now, I'm going to conclude by pointing out what God, seeing that he designed us. We go back to him and say, our children, show us therefore, Heavenly Father, what we need to do. Deuteronomy chapter 11, God's insight an instruction for his design. Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 through 20. 
Deuteronomy chapter 18, 11, sorry. Reading 18 through Eighteen through twenty. If you want to know how to live, go back and look at God as He educated Israel coming out of slavery, changing the mindset. And here He goes. He begins by saying, "Therefore, shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them." for a sign upon your hand that they may be as what? Frontinels between your eyes. We'll talk about this in a minute. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou what? Raisest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, upon thy gates. Let's look at what he's saying very carefully. First, he says, my words, which are my thoughts, my words are my thoughts. I want them to become you. So I said, with his words in your heart, I want them to become you. I want them to be a part of your entire being. I want it so that when you speak, you don't even know it, but you're speaking like how I would. Then the question is, how do I get there? He says, in Joshua 1 and verse 8, he says, meditate on these things. Before you speak, meditate on them. What do you meditate? Think about it continuously. We do that all the time. You know that the things you think about all the time becomes you. That's how we are changed by the things we think about. Either we are obsessed with it or we invite it in. But that which we think about continuously is that we become. And therefore he says... I want you to think about these things, what? Day and night. That's how information becomes you. And when information becomes you, it changes your thoughts, impacts your perception, the way you see things. When people see hardship, you see opportunity. Are you with me? When everybody goes that way, you say, no, 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 no. I'm going that way. Why? I see what they don't. Yeah. See what I'm getting at? So, God says, meditate on my word. It will change your perception. It will change the way you see things. An amazing thing is, when you change the way you perceive things, yea, the way you look at things, guess what? Everything changes. The world is a different world. Different from you saw yesterday. Yesterday. Number two, he says, bind them for a sign on your what? On your hand. A band on your hand is a constant reminder of what I told you, of what I have been teaching you. Making sure your behavior is compliant with what I'm teaching you. Are you with me? Making sure that that do, what you do, is completely in agreement with that which you know. Then he said also also that, that they may be as what? Fontanelles between your eyes. That means the way you see the world is going to be completely different. Folks, let's just be practical. If you go to work, and there is a challenge that you all are facing, insecurity perhaps with the job, whatever it is, if you are singing the same song as your colleagues 
who do not know what you know. What is that telling you? If you, know, you did not meditate, it's not a part of you. You're just in the presence, but not of the presence. He is not in here. He's not in here. Because when they see, the way you see that whatever the challenge is, must be, and it can only be different from the way they see it. They may see it as chaos and destruction. You see it as an opportunity. Anyway, I wish I had time to deal with that, but I'll just leave, let's leave it alone. There must be, therefore be fontanelles between your eyes. The way you see the world, the way you govern your perception, the way you think. And as he says in Joshua 1 and verse 8, he says, this law, book of the law, that is that information which I have given unto you, must never depart out of your mouth. But first, before you speak about it, speak less, think more. Meditate on them. How frequently? Day and night. That means continuously. Meditate on it. Day and night. That you may learn to do what? To observe and do. The observe and do, that's the behavior part. Because he's here, he impacts my behavior. Only then, folks, only then, when you are hearing, when you are receiving, when you are believing what he's telling you, and you have meditated on it to the point where it's affecting your behavior, the way you see things, then you can teach. You teach from experience. Remember, we must have a congruency between information and behavior. When you meditate on it, believing it, it becomes you. And when it becomes you, you know, remember in the, in the days back when you used to do your timetables and you had to learn them by what? By heart. You learn them till you learn them by heart. What does that mean? You don't have to think about it. Two times eight is what? Sixteen. You don't even think about it. It just pops right out. God says. And how did you get your timetables to that point? You spend time with it. Are you with me? You spend time with it. So you got it. And you say it a few times. Saying it a few times. You remember back in the day? Saying it a few times until what? You know it. And it goes beyond knowing it. It becomes part of who you are. So when you hear it, you have a response immediately. Likewise, God is saying, meditate on me, my words, my thoughts that I give unto you. The same thoughts I gave to Adam, I'm giving you. The same thought I give my son, I'm giving you. Look who your teacher is. How much time do you spend with your teacher? And he says, now that you are experiencing me, now that you're experiencing the impact of my words, my thoughts upon you, how you now you're experiencing what a new life looks like. As a matter of fact, when you receive his information, they become you, and you don't even know it. Your behavior change, you didn't try, that's just who you are. You see, Christianity these days is looking at what God says, then we try to copy it over here. Can't work. That's why we try and we fall, we try and we fall. But when you get it here, so it becomes a part of your thinking. All of a sudden, you are doing and don't even know you're doing. Now, when you tell your children, children are very intuitive. They're listening to your words, and they're watching your behavior. They're listening to your words, and they're watching your behavior. When they're congruent, that's facts. They will receive it. They will receive it. As a matter of fact, um, while on that point, I'm wrapping up, while on that point, there is something from my perspective that happens with children. From zero to about early teens, somewhere around in the teens. Everything you say, they just take it all in. 
very little fit, very little question. The younger, the more they take. No question. They take it right on in. When they get to that pre-adult stage, that's when they're asking questions now. Some of you say they're smelling themselves, right? <laughs> that's, that's exactly where I'm going now. What they do is simple, very simple. You did it, I did it. We all do it. Everything you were taught, you're doing like these ladies with these wonderful handbags, small suitcases. When you can't find anything, what do you do? You dump it. Am I right? You dump it all out, and you say, you know, something got to change. And what do you do? You start to select all that is important and put it back in the bag. Are you with me? And the things that are not that important, you walk away from. Children do the same thing. All the things you have taught them, that age, that little transitional age, they dump it all out. And then saying, I am a person now. And they look on that pile on the table of all you've taught them, and they say, I like that. I like that. My question is, I pray to God when you look inside their bag, their survival skill information is better than ours. Because we've always got a lot of junk in it. But they're able to pick up the good stuff and leave the bad stuff. Unfortunately, sometimes, because the inside part, they leave some of the good stuff. And pick up full foolishness and their, you know the rest. And they will fill it with their own stuff. So let's, that's why it's so important, so important of how we train our children. Congruency. So Jesus says, God says, now that you know, now that you're behaving likewise, now teach it to your children. Now notice he said, teach them what, how did he say to teach them? Diligently. When you what? When you get up, when you go to bed, when you walk by the way. By the way, you notice when the children are young, they are with you what? They're always, they're most comfortable when they're where? Right here. God says, teach them. Teach them. Little thing, teach them. Like how they want to know what's going on in the kitchen? Teach them. But also, by your behavior and what's important to you, you're saying, oh, God is so good. Talk to me, Mommy. Why do you say that? See what I'm getting at? It's in them now because that's where you are. You're not making it up. It's who you are. And he says, they must be hearing these words of wisdom that I have given to you all the time. They are getting, inf they are seeking information. That information, as you know, as we have said, will mold their thinking, govern their thoughts, and the impact it has on their insight will be absolutely tremendous. Tremendous. Therefore, Therefore, he also says, not only do you do it constantly, intentionally, but he also says, around the house, put a little reminders. You say doorpost? Little words of wisdom. Lift it out of the word. Put it up there. When you look at it, oh, I know what mommy is saying. I know what daddy is saying. They heard it out of your mouth. So when the challenges of life comes, and they now fall back in default. When they fall back in default, default meaning what is naturally you is actually what the essence of what going to make them make the right decision. I remember quite well when I was coming up, I would hear my mom say and dad, God, don't worry about it. God will make a way out of no way. It was, that was not just verbiage. It's something they live by. I knew it. And therefore, now it has a great impact on who I am. When the challenges come, folks, and <laughs> we must make sure that we exercise that which we know because God says, educate our children. And how do we educate them? By revealing who we are. It has been said many a times, the first God they get to know is us. Some of them have a hard time relating to a heavenly father because daddy is, mm, there's things lacking. See what I'm getting at? And he has those tremendous, 
God knows that we are not perfect. God knows we have made mistakes. However, may I encourage you to now use the resources that you have. That is, ask for the Holy Spirit, your counselor, to teach you. We always are learning. Remember, that's God's plan, to learn continuously. And we said, you know, I am smart enough to know I messed up. Holy Spirit, your kids, you got me. Change me. Reveal yourself. Teach me. Lead me into all truth. Amen. And by the way, when he leads you into all truth, I hope you understand the magnitude of that. When he leads you into all truth, every decision you make is the right one. What does that sound like to you? What does that look like to you? So you get connected with the Holy Spirit. And say, that's why he says, if you lack wisdom, ask of me, and I will give it to you generously through my Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is in you. That's how God speaks to you. Because it says in John, Jesus says, everything I want to teach you, I want to tell him, and he will tell it to you. Are you with me? So outside of him, we're needing but not being fulfilled. So even though we may have slipped, God has prepared it so, so that we can begin. And tell you what, when you discover something that makes a difference in your life, and you share it with your children, they'll see it, and they want to know. The same way if you find a more efficient way of making money. Let's use that. And they look at you, they can see the fruits of it. They want to know. The same way when they hear and see the impact that the word has, they will want to know. So your kids are always your kids. And they're always, when do they call you? They're getting older. Mine are getting older. But they're always in my pocket. <laughs> always. When challenges come that they don't know how to handle it, Dad, they're looking for wisdom. I pray, God, that what comes out of your mouth is not just solving the immediate need, but giving them insight for eternity. May God bless you. How many of us would like to invite him in an afternoon service one day and just let's talk about this? We have to have a school. We have to. You may not like me, but we have to. We have to. When I look at our babies, those are our babies. And I don't want it ever to be said at Shiloh, we didn't help educate our babies. I'm serious. I don't know what it's going to take. I want every last one of our kids to go to school. We got to have them in the hands of Jesus before the world gets them. We've lost too many. Can you say we've lost too many? Come on, we lost too many. And now we're praying for God to bring them back. We lost too many. Dr. Patterson is saying today makes so much sense. The world can't have all of our kids' brain. If God made it for eternity, then he must be putting something in it. God got to do it. Thank you, Ann. And so as we work on how Shiloh will have a school, we're not in comparison with anybody. We just want to do what God said. How many believe God will provide the means for us to do that? I believe it. I believe it. And one of these days we can smile and say, look what you have done with our children. With our children. They're already brilliant. And God wants to take them to a whole nother level. He wants to send them in neighborhoods and places where they can reach people you can never touch. 
but they can be tremendous advocates for Jesus. If the Lord sent me to Shiloh for this reason alone, I'm glad to be here to do this. But we got to have a school. We got to have a school. I need you to work with me. Let's work with God. Come on, do the benediction. Thank you, Doc. stand for the benediction. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this service. Thank you for the pastor and help. Thank you for letting him bring us a, um, a sermon and thank you for letting us all be here today. Bless us as we all go home. Thank you for letting us fellowship and also I'm done. Please save us in Jesus' name.